This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream, in partnership with my streaming service, Nebula. Hey, happy Friday. This week, Google finally launched Fuchsia, its new operating system, Microsoft had its annual build conference with lots of new announcements, and the BBK Empire launched yet another brand, because, you know, having five phone brands is just not enough. As always, we also have a brand new tech knowledge quiz, and it is a lightning round edition this week, so you have 90 seconds to complete 20 questions. Good luck, you speed demons. Links are in the description, and welcome to the Friday checkout. Okay, my favorite new releases this week were the CoolPad Cool 20, which is an ultra budget phone. And the only interesting thing about it is that this brand was dead for years and has just been brought back to life again with this phone, it seems. Then the OnePlus Cyberpunk Limited Edition smartwatch, which based on the reviews is probably about as buggy as Cyberpunk was when it launched on consoles, but also like Cyberpunk looks absolutely dope in my opinion. And finally, the very confusing Redmi Note 8 2021 edition. That's right, Xiaomi probably thought to themselves, hey, we've launched like a dozen mid-range phones this year alone, but that is not enough. Let's also revive one of our random phones from a year and a half ago as well. Makes sense. And the most upvoted product of the last seven days is surprisingly the DJI Robomaster Tello Talent, which is a small educational drone with a little dot matrix display on top, which people can learn to code on. Pretty nifty. We've had about 70 new releases just this week, so check them out if you haven't already. There's a ton of cool stuff in there. And upload your favorites to help me pick the community favorites for next week. Links are in the description. Okay, my first story of the week will be Realme launching a new sub-brand called Dizo, is how you pronounce them, I suppose. And yes, that makes Dizo a sub-brand of Realme Tech Life, which is a sub-brand of Realme, which is a sub-brand of Oppo, which is a brand of BBK. So that's the pretty insane hierarchy here. And the announcement post says that Dizo is their first Tech Life brand, meaning others are likely to come in the future too. Anyway, Dizo is apparently going to cover smart entertainment, so probably TVs and smart speakers, smart home, smart care, whatever that is, and accessories. In other words, pretty much anything that isn't a phone could technically fall under this brand. And for now, at least, they seem to be aimed at India, although I guess that's only temporary. And Diesel has a real, like, hey, Xiaomi, can I look at your homework kind of vibe to it, because it is basically a carbon copy of the Xiaomi ecosystem business model. With Diesel, Realme has explicitly said that they will not design or make the products themselves, but they will handpick trusted suppliers and sell their products instead and provide support for them in a central manner, just like Xiaomi does with their gajillion partner products. To be clear, many of the phone brands already outsource many of their own non-smartphone products, even if they are sold under their own brand. So as Utsav Tehi has pointed out, some OnePlus and Xiaomi TVs come from the exact same external supplier, for example, and are almost identical. The Nokia branded earbuds are designed and made by a company called Richco, etc. So this isn't like a new, new concept, but Xiaomi and now Realme, of course, are doing this on a much larger scale. And I think this is a really smart strategy. Xiaomi and Realme in this role are basically curators and they put their own sort of guarantee behind many, many products. And what this means is that the consumer can suddenly shop from a lot of suppliers that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to verify and trust individually. It means that for the suppliers, they can suddenly reach a lot of consumers that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to effectively reach. And it means that Xiaomi and Realme get to create a gigantic ecosystem without actually having to create most of the products themselves. So I think this is sort of a win-win-win. Okay, my second story of the week will be all the interesting little things Microsoft announced at and around their big build conference this year, which of course is their main developer event for the year. First, right before build, there were two news for Windows on ARM, specifically that Qualcomm has launched their second generation entry-level processor for Windows, the Snapdragon 7C Gen 2, that should be the next default ARM chip to power devices in the two to $600 range, although they were very vague on the details besides saying that it is fast faster by an unspecified amount, and that the first devices to feature it would come out this summer. And then they also announced the Snapdragon Developer Kit, which is running this new second generation 7C chip. 
Now, if you remember, Apple, when they transitioned macOS to their own ARM chips, released a so-called developer transition kit, which was just a Mac mini with an iPad chip in it. And the concept is pretty much the same here. It's basically a cheap way for developers to test Windows on ARM and port their apps over, although they haven't actually announced just how much it will cost. And I can't help but think that this really should have been the first ARM device that launched on Windows, like Apple did it with theirs, rather than getting released two years years into Windows on ARM being in the wild. I am happy that Qualcomm and Microsoft are working on Windows on ARM and on the chips that power them, but both of these announcements seem very vague and sort of low commitment, which is really strange in my opinion, especially when Apple is going from strength to strength with their chips, and on the Windows side we get this. Anyway, the other Microsoft news included a bunch of developer stuff, like a better Windows terminal, which I'm personally a big fan of, and letting almost all developers running WSL2 access full Linux apps with graphical user interfaces right on Windows, which is really cool. Plus, Satya announced that a quote, next generation of Windows was going to be announced soon. There was a lot of speculation originally about this being Windows 11 as sort of the next generation, although Microsoft employees shot that fantasy, I guess, down quite quickly and quite thoroughly. So instead, what we think this is referring to is something codenamed Sun Valley. I've talked about this before, from what we know, it's basically just going to be a big UI refresh that will port many of the things Microsoft teased with Windows 10X over to regular Windows, and it will make everything look and sort of behave in a more modern way. And again, I think it is nice that Microsoft is finally doing something with Windows again, but with Chrome OS on the one hand growing at absolutely insane numbers, making up over 17% of sales last quarter because of just how much more light weight, so much cheaper and much more easier to manage it is for schools and other organizations. And on the other hand, Mac OS wiping the floor with Windows on the chip front now, I can't help but think that Microsoft really needs more than just a UI refresh. Windows market share is down to just 73% last quarter, which is down from like over 90 just a couple of years ago. The change is real. I know that there's a lot of consumers like gamers or enterprise customers who will never change away from Windows because they're basically locked in to this ecosystem, but the change is real. It is happening incredibly quickly, and I just don't really see what Microsoft has planned to stop it. Anyway, apparently there will be a dedicated Windows event in just a few weeks, so I really hope that they'll announce something to change my mind. And while we're talking about operating systems, my third story of the week will be Google surprising everyone by bringing Fuchsia to real consumer devices for the first time ever, starting with the first generation Nest Hub. The update has apparently already started rolling out to people in the preview program and will roll out to everyone over the next few months, and Google says that functionally nothing should change for its users at first. And the Nest platform to me originally seemed like a really weird platform to start with, but actually the more that I think about it, the more I think it makes sense, for three specific reasons. First, the Nest products from Google currently run a custom Linux-based operating system called Cast OS, and apparently the entire UI on top is built in Flutter, which is Google's cross-platform development kit that runs on Android, iOS, Windows, Mac, Linux, and now Fuchsia. So that is probably why Google could just swap out the underlying bits without too much change to the user. Second, unlike with Android, where Google would have to deal with a ton of device types, manufacturer customizations, and app compatibility issues, the software on Google's smart home products is fully centralized and controlled by Google, and so it should just be much smaller and easier in scope to deal with. And third, while Google doesn't actually release sales figures, my estimates based on market share figures is that there are probably millions if not tens of millions of Nest Hubs out there, so it is actually a significant enough user base to start testing things with at scale. I imagine other smart home products like for example maybe the Chromecast will be next to receive Fuchsia after this rollout, and I actually think that other device types, for example smartphones and Chromebooks, that will be significantly more complicated and that will take way more time than this, but still I'm excited to see how this new OS performs in the wild, because I think competition is good. Now, if you are like me and you like to root for the new kid on the block, why not check out Nebula? 
Nebula is our very own video streaming service. It is beautifully made and it is built and owned by some of YouTube's smartest educational creators, including Real Engineering, Wendover Productions, me of course, and many new additions like Marcus Brownlee and even Strange Parts. We upload all of our videos there at free and without tracking. My tech out there ones usually go up there even a day or two earlier, and there is an ever-growing list of fantastic Nebula originals, including the latest one from Neo, which discusses displays populations with simply incredible visualizations, or a whole series on weird epidemics if you haven't had enough of our own one yet, etc. Nebula lets you watch premium content ad-free and without annoying tracking, and it lets us create high-quality stuff for you without having to worry about the middleman. And best of all, you can get access to Nebula for free with a subscription to my sponsor CuriosityStream, which itself is less than 15 bucks for an entire year. So that's like barely more than a dollar a month. CuriosityStream is, of course, the premier place on the internet for high-quality professional documentaries from the founder of the Discovery Channel, and they have a huge library of science, nature, and history content to binge while you are stuck at home. I've recently finished watching an episode of Catalyst on CuriosityStream, which took a closer look at the potential of quantum computing, and there's tons of other great content from hosts like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, Stephen Hawking, and more. So check them out at the link in the description, and I'll see you next Friday.